Shot. We'll do real disc golf podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I am the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me, as always, Josh Mansfield. We are rocking and rolling. It is Tuesday, January 17th. We are approximately one month from disc golf. We will begin the All-Star Weekend about a month from now, and then we will head into a Las Vegas Challenge a week later. Lots to get excited for, and today we are going to start to shift our attention away from 2022 and the offseason and the contracts into this upcoming season. Super excited to get started talking about that. Honestly, Josh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to be done talking about contracts. I think you're just ready to be done because you're mad that you said it was going to be a slow off season and you were wrong again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd want to quit talking about them too. If every time you got a contract listen, was a reminder of how listen, wrong you were. I would, I would posit <laughs> that other than the Simon news, which obviously was a big, big deal, mm-hmm. which, you know, I think we foreshadowed, sure. uh, it was a normal off season. If the Simon move doesn't happen, is anything really like blowing your mind? Uh, no, I think like the biggest news is probably the Discraft signing. Yeah. That That's what we'd be talking well, like, about. If- Anthony Barella left at the end of an Innova contract. Okay. The only big mm-hmm. shock, right, is Valerie Mondahano leaving Valerie, early who was on a two year and switching yeah. to Discraft. But like, I don't think that on its own is enough to qualify it as like a crazy offseason like last year. Just my opinion. Look. One one big contract changes if it's a big off season. It's true. One win is enough to give you a bad wallpaper on your phone for the entire oh, NFL God. season. I was just telling somebody about that. <laughs> they were like, the 49ers lost the Broncos? I was like, somehow yeah. they did. One one of like four teams shocked the, Bronco, the Broncos. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, listen, it's totally true. The Simon the Simon <laughs> news is as big as we've had in in since Macbeth, I think. Um so, which remember it was only two years ago. Which you know the pomp and circumstance of the Ricky thing last year was was definitely like a wow factor. But you know Simon is just like a, he is a, at a level of like popularity and like mm-hmm. of the culture that I don't think Ricky quite reaches. Um, even though Ricky's the better player. Yeah. So anyway. We're going to wrap up the at least what we know of contracts for now. Who knows? Maybe we'll get a curveball later. But basically, all the big names have now landed somewhere. So let's dive right in. Uh, Again, you can always go check out our active contracts tracker to see what's going on. Uh, That's being updated. I just got a fresh batch of updates today. Uh, The big first thing, Josh, Paige Shu. We were wondering where she headed, and it's Discraft one year deal on the uh the tour team the second tier team uh of course they announced their elite team as we talked about on last week's show so Paige Shu gonna be on team discraft which i heard rumors of that but it still feels like a little bit of a surprise just given the way she was talking about the you know the change she was making when she was on the show with us mm-hmm. yeah i i <laughs> I think it was definitely a little bit more disc hype than it was truly like, oh, this is like disc innovation. Like her bag is going to be comprised of molds that have been patented since <laughs> the early 2000s. <laughs> um, but I, I think what's really interesting to me is that Paige Shoe really could have commanded a pretty decent offer, I feel, from a smaller company, at least maybe a, a smaller deal to start kind of an investment sort of thing, but then get her on a long, you know, a two year deal or something because she's coming back in. I think there would have been opportunity for a smaller manufacturer, which is what I, I was expecting to happen. Um, whether it be a smaller manufacturer or someone like prodigy, for example, who uh, doesn't have FPO players anymore. Uh, those kind of felt like where it was the natural landing place. Definitely not a team that is arguably one of the deepest FPO teams in the the competition. Right I mean, now. I think so. the the counter argument, Josh. While while I understand what you're saying, that if you're a smaller manufacturer, are you going to risk taking on a player who hasn't really competed in a meaningful way for like three or four years? And it's Discraft's true, like, it's, sure, we can do that. I mean, I you know, I think yeah. Paige Shu has the potential to come back and be a factor on tour, but also wouldn't shock me if she wasn't. 
if she was just kind of finishing me, me in neither. the 20s, 15s, 20s. Yeah, but there aren't there are not many world champions who are active players right now on the FPO side. That's true. Anyway, I so. mean, makes a lot of sense Good as for a her landing though. spot. Yeah, it does. And she'll be back out on the road with Grady uh, as they navigate trying to be pro disc golfers and traveling with a baby, which is going to be a lot to handle. Uh, but I think go ahead. I think it's a toddler. I think yeah. the, I think Savannah's like almost well, two and okay. a half. I, I yeah. guess I don't really know where you <laughs> define the ending point for baby, but I I didn't want I just no no I I didn't mean to push semantics. <laughs> I just didn't want people imagining like an infant. They're walking around with like yeah it, like an infant. Yeah no no. They've got a you know a bag with a uh, baby carrier walking <laughs> around on the course. Uh, okay, so then we've got um, let's see. Linus Carlson signs a five year extension with Latitude sixty four. Feels like kind of a must for them to to re-sign him. He's got the potential to be big star. I mean, I don't know if he quite like reached the highs of you know Nicholas Antila last year, but uh, all the skill to do so. I think that European MPO players are at a must-buy time in their contracts and lock them down at their current prices as long as possible because they are only going to get better the longer they compete in the United States. They're going to gain more notoriety both in Europe and the United States. They're going to move more plastic. It's just a matter of time. So locking them down at current prices, I feel like, is a really, really smart move for someone like Latitude 64. Uh, We've got Austin Turner signing a one-year deal with DGA. So uh, another Austin on Team DGA. Jake Mon signs a one-year deal with Discraft. Remember Jake Mon, the seventeen-year-old uh, who popped off last at the end of last season. I mean, he was really impressive for a couple tournaments there. I'm like trying to remember exactly what his finishes were. I'll pull it up. Um, but he went to he was eleventh at Butler County. He was uh, 22nd at GMC, but 19th at USDGC, 20th at Worlds. But like he was in the mix. Like he ended up falling down. He the made leaderboard. a lead card yeah. somewhere. He certainly yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, interesting signing there. I think uh, he's somebody to keep an eye on for sure. Yeah. I, I, you always forget that guy's 17 because he's built like an NFL linebacker. Guy's enormous. <laughs> Uh, that's that's the only thing I ever remember about him. So uh, good for him, though, to, to see that deal. I mean, he's definitely someone, I think you said, there are a couple of people on that MPO category who showed us what their ceiling can be and who are incredibly young players. A couple other things I don't remember if we mentioned last week. Zach Melton uh, extends with Dynamic Discs for a year. Madison Walker back with MVP. And so that pretty much gets us to the end of the list. I'm sure there'll be a few things trickling in here over the next few weeks, uh, but uh, mostly players locked in, ready to go for the upcoming season. So that brings us to the injury report. And we have to begin with the big news. Uh, This is kind of like our preseason, where do players stand conversation. Uh, But the news from just yesterday, Valerie Mondahano posts on Instagram, quote, due to an unfortunate event on the disc golf course has resulted in a grade three sprain on my left ankle, a minimum three to four week hiatus from disc golf and all other sports, including walking. The result of the injury means I may miss the first two events of the year, all star event and LVC. With all that being said, please wish me fast healing and great patience. If you would like further details, you can check it out tomorrow on the Johnny disc golf channel. So, Valerie Matahano, grade three sprain. Now, three to four weeks, like, immobilized, to me does not necessarily mean three to four weeks to return to disc golf. This could be a longer break than even Valerie is alluding to here. So last winter, I actually had a, a grade three sprain as well, playing volleyball. And my physical therapist put me in a boot for three and a half, four weeks. And then I did physical therapy for two and a half, three months before I started playing disc golf again. 
uh, just because that pivot motion. Now, granted, it was on my plant yeah, foot. Yeah, that's which worse. Does not seem to be the case, which is worse because that pivot motion was uh, very just out of the question for for so long. But it's and and I mean, Valerie is a professional athlete. Like I expect that she probably I mean, that's going to be her focus, right? That this is just recovery, and so I I'm sure her timeline is going to be quicker. But if she is back. In, I mean, what's the Texas swings through March? Yeah. I would be surprised if she doesn't miss some of the Texas swing. I mean, and the question is like, do you really want to rush back? You know, the problem with a grade three sprain, are you still dealing with recurring yes. issues? If I step funny, I put on a brace the next time I play disc golf for like oh, two weeks out. Uh, I mean, let me let me yeah. just this is what the grade three sprain means. Complete tear of the ligament in the ankle, complete instability because the ligament is torn. This is a problem because it can create ligament issues that persist into the future. And you can tend to have more sprains in the future, usually of a lower severity, mm -hmm. grades one or two. But it's not uncommon to have like consistent ankle problems for forever. And, you know, the again, like you said, the good news is this is on Valerie's trail leg. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're still having, obviously, to push off on that leg, but you're not putting the kind of torque that you're putting on your front ankle. Right. Um, you know, she's right-handed right -handed thrower. So, but, you know, like, it's going to mess with the timing and, and feel on the forehand, of course, because that's going to be the front foot. Um... I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see her until like Champions Cup because th th there's just it, it's hard. You can't go from zero to disc golf it, or, or if you do, it's it's like really risky that you're going to re injure. So I, you know, this this is terrible timing. And, uh, you know, you wonder if she like slipped off a tee pad or something. That's that's brutal. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know. Like I, I still have a, a split tendon tear in my perennial tendon and my therapist was like, you can get it a lot stronger and it probably won't bug you much, but if you want to get rid of it completely, it has to be surgery. So, yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know about, about Valerie's, uh, you know, what tendon she or ligament she damaged, but it's, it's no, it's no laughing matter. That's, that's for sure. And a month a month feels like a far too conservative estimate as to when she's going to be back. Uh, some folks uh, in the Ulti World Disc Golf Discord for subscribers um, talking to physical therapists or have had experience. There's somebody uh, at PDGA Stats mentioning that he talked to somebody who's a physical therapist who covers the NFL and says two to three months is a more likely timetable for return to sport. So obviously, you know, NFL is a different scenario than uh, than disc golf on the on the non plant foot, but still, you know, you don't want to you don't want to come back too soon. So, uh, obviously, hoping for a full recovery for Valerie and that she can get back out there. It's just terrible timing. I mean, you know, you do this back at the beginning of the off season, like you have got plenty of time to get ready to go, but that uh, you know, right after you announce the new contract and everything, it's it's brutal. Yeah, it is. Uh, so then, of course, we have some other players who are dealing with longer term injury situations. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about Eagle McMahon. You know, Josh, where do you think like if you're going into a fantasy league? Mm -hmm. Where is Eagle drafted? Like where wh like wh where do you des decide to take Eagle? He's in our composite rankings, which combines our rankings with the PDGA's U discs and stat mandos into one combined ranking he's at number 11 right now now obviously skill wise he's higher than that but you know competition wise last year he didn't play that much so you know he falls down this list a little bit is that around where you take him do you think he should go lower do you think he should go at the spot where he might go if he was healthy which is like <laughs> top three for sure <laughs> I, I if i'm in a fantasy league i take eagle at five I take Ricky, Paul, Calvin, Gannon, all above Eagle, and then I take Eagle because an upside Eagle 
even if you only get half a season of Eagle, it's still probably more fantasy points than most of the other guys behind him. It just the amount of wins that Eagle could rack up, it, even if only half the season is healthy. We're talking a, a handful of wins and a possible major that just a ceiling that is unmatched by so many other players. So I, I that's probably where I would take Eagle if I was in a fantasy league. Like it's still still round one material, but but the like last my last round one pick. You know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of motivation for Eagle to play. And I also think it's mm-hmm. kind of at the situation at this point where if he is still hurt, if he is still dealing with pain on high power forehands, that's just something he's going to have to live with and play through and adjust his game, much like we've seen Simon do, versus trying to take more time off. Because at this point, you've taken the time off. There's no alternative. Like if you're struggling really bad in the middle of the season and you're dealing with all kinds of, you know, pain, then I think you have to consider like, well, maybe there's a surgical option that's going to help me solve this long term. But otherwise, you just have to deal with it, right? So I am expecting to see Eagle play a pretty full schedule this year. He also has a lot of motivation to do that because he's in a contract year. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I don't know if I don't even know if I take Gannon ahead of Eagle. I can see the argument for the other three guys just because it's like they feel like a little bit more of a sure thing. Mm-hmm. But you know, if Eagle is is good to go, I mean, he could he could be the player of the year this year. Like it, it, it that's the ceiling easily. It, it absolutely it absolutely is. Um, but let me tell you. Uh, I drafted Christian McCaffrey on the assumption that he was good to go a couple of times in fantasy leagues, and that blew up spectacularly in my face. And so <laughs> maybe I'm just a little more risk averse in fantasy than most people. Uh, but that that's like Gannon won USDGC. He was on the cusp of winning multiple I, I get times. It. Right. I Would you be shocked if Gannon was a multi-time winner this season? I wouldn't be shocked. No, I wouldn't either. Um, I don't know where I would take an over under at one and a half, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me. And so given that that's the case, I probably would put Eagle at five, but I think argument be made for sure at four. Very interesting. Uh, you know, and, and if you, if you're not going to like, if you know that you're going to have to choose one of those guys and that, you know, you're in a draft where you're not going to get another top tier player. Like you just you almost have to take him, right? If you're in an eight person league, mm-hmm. you almost have to take him because otherwise you just have no high upside on your team. Like where are you right. gonna find some there's only so many guys who are gonna dominate every single week and get you those points week in, week out. And like he clearly is one of those guys. And it could it could be disastrous for you, but I think you have to roll the dice. I think so too. All right. Well, uh who else we got on the uh the injury report, Josh? Well, we definitely have to keep an eye on Kristen Tatar. Uh, we expect her to be fully recovered. She did undergo surgery uh, for the nerve pain that she was experiencing in her throwing arm. Uh, I have not seen a lot of updates on the injury. Um, the most recent one that I saw was quite a while back saying everything was progressing well uh, afterwards that she's expecting to be uh, ready for the season and still seems the indications to me. Definitely going to be something to watch. But the biggest thing about Kristen's injury is, and we remember this very well from last year, it hurts to throw. She had to manage her game accordingly, but she couldn't make it worse. So unless something went horribly wrong with the surgery, I see worst case scenario as being the same one, right? It hurts to throw, can't injure it worse. So she's just going to play because, you know, welcome to to her life. It's not like she played poorly down the stretch of the right. season <laughs> right right like once yeah. she knew it was so, okay to play and that she wasn't gonna <laughs> aggravate it and like psychologically she was ready to go she was as dominant as she was at any point in the year uh yep so that that's not as worried about Kristen's. um i think that's everybody that i can think of on the injury report for right now that we need to keep an eye on. Do you take Kristen at number one in a draft? Yes, absolutely. 
Yeah, I, I just, I don't know how you can't like even injured the the dominance of every tournament she played last season. I don't know if she's going to replicate it. That that is that is a tall order to replicate. But how can you not? I think I think the reason to do it is that the consistency was mm-hmm. also there. It wasn't just that she was winning. It was that she was never losing badly. Lo- she didn't miss the That's podium. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right? And so, like, you imagine, like, what's a worst-case scenario? Like, she's her skill is so high. Her mm-hmm. upshots are so clean. Her putting is strong enough that she's never going to be mi- missing, like, top five. So it's just, like, you know you're going to bank points week in and week out. Like, yep. even if you know, Paige has a resurgent season and is the better player this year, which I could see that 100%. Well, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. I still think that from just like a overall, like risk management perspective, it makes sense to take her number one. I think so too. Okay. Who do you take at number two in FPO? I mean, it, 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 you have to take either Katrina or Paige. I, I don't really see an argument. I mean, you know, Valerie is now like going to drop down the board a little bit potentially because of the concerns there. I don't think I can trust Hannah or Evelina. I didn't no. think Haley played enough last year. Like that's a that's a risk factor for fantasy on its own. Just like simple availability. Do you play? Yeah. I, I guess the better question should be, can is there a reason to take Katrina over Paige? Sure. I think Katrina looked fantastic at many points last year and overall mm-hmm. probably was a little bit more impressive to me in terms of just like level of consistency. Now, they, they both had kind of like valleys of performance. Mm-hmm. Katrina had that big stretch in the middle where she just was playing bad and then she came back and looked yeah. amazing at throw pink. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. I, I just don't think so. I think Paige, I don't, I don't Paige, think so either. Paige is just... She's still, even when she's like not playing her best, she's still winning more than Katrina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. I don't think there is. I mean, Paige also has two majors. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, though. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Okay, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to take a look at some big picture storylines for the 2023 season. So if you're new to the sport or you're new to listening to the show, Uh, and you're getting ready to follow the tour, we're going to get you ready. Coming up. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. Did you know the Pound makes more than disc golf backpacks? That's right. They've got beverage carriers. I've got one. They're awesome. They've got travel bags like the Fly Pack. You can even get a toolbox to have a practice bag in the trunk of your car, a fanny pack, packing cubes, and a whole lot more. Go to pounddiscgolf.com and trick yourself out with pound bags for every aspect of your bag needs. Welcome back to The Upshot. It's time to take a look at the 2023 big picture storylines as we get ready to head into the upcoming season. Obviously, we've got a lot to talk about with the golf itself, and we're going to break down our favorite tournaments and all kinds of stuff in future weeks. But today, we're just going to focus on what are the big stories that we're keeping an eye on this year. Uh, We're going to talk about on the course stuff and off the course stuff. Josh, I'll let you decide which should we do first. You know what? Let's let's do on the course. That's that's why we we watch disc golf. The other stuff is interesting, but it's all it all boils down to watching the action on the course. So I think it would only be fitting if we did that one first. Love it. So uh, I'll I'll give you one right off the top. Okay. One of the things that I'm really interested in: Do we see a sea change this year between the old guard established stars? And the young up and comers. Now, obviously, this is always going to be a fluid thing. But 
you have a lot of players right now in both divisions who are under the age of 25, who are incredibly promising, but they're still not the, the top players. Mm -hmm. the, the stars of the sport right now are the players older than 25, many of which have been around a long time. Your Pauls, your Rickies, your Kristens, your Pages. But then you also have your Hennas, your Evelinas, your Gannons, and all of these young players, Isaac Robinson, who have the capacity to become those big stars. Now, this is something that maybe you could come up with every single year, but it just feels like... You know, last year, it was like return of the Europeans, right? Mm -hmm. They're coming back. How are they going to do? But we didn't really have this kind of like sense that the young players are going to take over. But I feel like we're getting close to that point where we could see that shift start to happen. So is this the year? I, I think I don't think we're ever going to mark a year as the year, right? That this this is the moment it happened. Sure. Uh, including this year. I think every year as time goes on, there will be more and more players who win. And, and it's interesting because like the number of wins that Paul and Ricky get outside of their like truly dominant seasons. Uh, what is it? 2014 Paul or 2015 Paul where he won. What? No, what year was it? What year did Paul win? I think it was 14 where he just 14? won everything when he won everything. Yeah. Outside of those dominant years, the number of wins that they're getting is is pretty consistent. It go it's dropped a little bit, but they're still winning a handful of events. The difference is, is we're just getting more and more events. So we're, rather than them increasing their you know ma maintaining the same share, you could say of wins, there's just it's there are more people who are winning. But Paul and Ricky are still capturing a dominant amount of wins between the two of them. Probably will capture a dominant amount of wins between the two of them this year as well. It's that share of wins that's going to slowly continue to ebb away, and I don't expect any pair to take over that. If you'd asked me two or three years ago, I probably would have said Eagle and Calvin would do would be the next group, right? That when they their combined wins and majors in a season surpassed Paul's and Ricky's, that's your mark. That's that's the transition point, the year where it passes to the new guard. But with Gannon's emergence, Isaac Robinson, Nicholas Antela. Uh, so many people that you have to consider now. Simon too, like the resurgence of Simon. Now, sure. like Simon, I guess you contribute like Simon's wins to Paul and Ricky's now and consider them the, the old guard together. The way that it is diversifying with the new guard and, and the amount of skill and that is just diffused across so many young players is I don't think we'll ever have a single transition point, but rather, as we've talked about, a point where it closely resembles a PGA style tour where somebody gets three wins and they had an incredible season and just winning the, a major like the masters is enough to make a really big deal out of your season. Going to be fun to see what you got for our next storyline. Well, my next storyline kind of keeps in that same vein. Uh, it's the Paul and Ricky storyline. It's, it's the storyline uh, that has been consistent for a decade. And it, I think it's going to be really interesting to see this year where like where are Paul and Ricky at coming off of the player of the year award and the major winner six time world six times at world's Paul who insists that, you know, majors are the more important part of the sport. It, 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 it does not cease to be an interesting discussion. These two, I mean, it's just, you know, it's your tiger versus Phil. I mean, mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, we still have at least another four or five years of these guys at the top of their game. And so it's going to be incredibly compelling. Uh, you know, I don't know that we've had quite as many head to head absolute classic battles as maybe we might like. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, overall season performance, it's definitely something we're going to continue to watch. And I think you could say the same thing, Josh, about Kristen versus Paige Redux. I mean, in some ways, Coming into the year, last season, it didn't really feel like that was going to be the, the narrative. But it became the narrative quickly yep. and was pretty much the, the story of the whole year. I think we're still there going into 2023. I mean, we just, yeah, the Pro Tour just did a head-to-head, -head, you know, Kristen versus Paige. Um, and, you know, Kristen won that battle. Mm-hmm. 
Christian won that battle. But Paige had more major success. And so what happens in 2023? It's going to be, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if we're watching them at LVC going (laughs) head to head in the final round. Without a doubt. Uh, You know, this actually continues, I think, into the nice storyline next that I want to get to. Remember at the beginning of the season when Valerie Montahano was playing incredible and we're like, oh, FPO right now is, is the big four, right? Sure. And then Valerie began to drop off and we realized that it, it probably never was the big four, right? It's it's always been the big three. Paige, well, recently has been the big three. Past <laughs> couple of years. Always, always. Is, uh, I'm going to back that up real quick. Uh, it, it's over the past two years has been the big three, really. Yeah. Paige, Kristen, and Katrina. And and that's who it is. Charlie, do you think there's anybody who can meaningfully challenge and break into that big three? Not just like I mean, Haley King won a major. Great. Right. Uh, Own had lots of consistent performances. Great. Uh, Henna could win a tournament this year. Great. But like really meaningfully challenge the big three for that kind of title. For when we look at the end of the year and we say that person was clearly correct on the level, a part of that grouping because i don't Mm -hmm. think that you can name a player that makes that grouping at the end of 2022 no one you know lots of players had a good year but nobody was like fully in that mix Mm -hmm. um yeah i think there's i mean that's a story to watch can somebody do it do i think somebody can do it sure i mean there's so many players who have the capacity to Mm -hmm. be that Haley, but she's got to play more she's got to play more consistently hannah and evelina well, we know what they need to do. They need to put the disc into the basket from 15 feet. That's really all they need to do. And they could be in that mix. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, does Own reach that level? I mean, she's talking about adding some distance. How much does she really need to add to get into that mix? I mean, it's possible. Obviously, Valerie Mondahano, the setback with the injury, that could be an issue. Um you know, Missy Gannon could take a step forward. I, I think there's a lot of players, Ella Hansen, that could Holland Handley. I could keep going. You, you get my point. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of players who have the ceiling to be in that conversation, but we haven't seen anybody be able to do it with enough regularity to really be seriously considered for that to be to be included in that spot, you know, over the course of a whole season. Um so T B D, but I think it's a fun fun conversation. What if Paige Shu comes back and wow. wins at GMC, wins Worlds again, where she won it five years ago? It'd be pretty amazing. That'd be the most incredible storyline. I'd need some big, big odds on that, though. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I, imagine what what would the odds need to be preseason Paige Shu Worlds winning Worlds? Like astronomical. I think I need at least 40 to one. Yeah. At least. At least. It's just, it's, it felt like a long shot then, and it really feels like a long <laughs> shot now. I mean, she hasn't played really, but it'd be pretty incredible. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, no. I, I, I know, I know it's a long shot, but fun storyline. Uh, let's go to an obvious one from recent times. Simon, new bag. Yep. New sponsor, new motivation for him. Mm-hmm. And how does that play out? You know, he's coming off a year. I think. Most fans are not going to expect him to play like he did last year. I think it's unrealistic to expect him to win four tournaments again in 2023. But even a couple wins, I think, would be vindicating and make everybody happy. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm mostly curious to see how he handles coming off of a career year and making a big change. And... You know, can he keep up the consistency? And, you know, obviously the the talent is there. He's also getting a little bit older. Let's see what happens. I mean, you know, I feel like people are people, me, you, yeah. we're talking about Simon as regressing, right? Mm-hmm. But is there a world in which he wins player of the year? It, it, yeah. Why, it, why not, Josh? Um, It's because he's historically one of the worst top content the worst of the top contenders at the majors unquestionably true but like right. if if he that, turns that, a statistical that around anomaly or is that is there something going on there yeah i 
it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't. Unless you think that he has like significant mental hurdles at majors. I don't really see the signs of him like choking under pressure. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what is it about the majors? I, I, I don't know, but that that's if Simon wins a major this year, as long as his season is not limited by injury, right? So as long as he doesn't have an Eagle season next season, if he plays the full season and wins a major, I don't care what he does the rest of the, the, the season. I think that's right. I think that adds to the resume in the areas that he needs it, he, and, and it just doesn't matter. It's it's the one missing feather in the cap. Yep. Um, that brings up, I guess, my next topic: health of Eagle. He's he's registered for LVC. Haven't heard a lot about you know lingering injuries. It seems like he's ready, but it's going to be something to watch. It, is it just me? I feel like this season feels a lot like a make or break kind of year for Eagle where we either see Eagle return to form healthy again, or he gets injured again. And we see him as, you know, the, what could have been. And, and that's it, his career is going to be plagued by injuries. And that's just probably what we should expect. That's how it feels to me a little bit. It's understandable to have that sentiment coming off of the year that he just had. And, you know, with stuff like an injury, you just don't know, you know, you, Mm -hmm. he could get hurt again, miss time, and then come back in 24 and become the number one player. It's definitely possible. I definitely think. possible. But, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a contract year. It's a, you know, he's got to be just champing at the bit to get out there and play on the pro tour again. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, it's important from like a psychological perspective and from a narrative perspective more than necessarily an injury perspective. Um, but yeah, it does feel like an important year for Eagle. I mean, I think he made the mature decision last year to, to really limit his playing time. I think so too. And so, you know, does that pay off? I, I hope that it does. And I hope that he's just rocks and rolls because he, he, he could have a huge year. Yeah. I think he, he has as good a chance of anybody of you know taking home number one spot in the pro tour standings mm -hmm. uh i would say next up um, do we see prodigy continue to have the kind of breakout success from their team that they had last year because you got players on expiring contracts mm-hmm you have a kind of a down year from your star player, Kevin Jones. Does he bounce back? Do we see the continued emergence of Gannon and Isaac, or do they, you know, maybe fall back in the rankings a little bit? What are we going to see from the rest of that, you know, young core, Alden Harris? Uh, and can they parlay that into maybe getting another one of those guys locked up for the long term? That's tough. Um, I think the biggest advantage that Prodigy has is number of players with a very high ceiling. Gannon is incredibly consistent. Isaac is pretty consistent. Alden is less consistent. And Kevin Jones is also like fairly consistent. But the benefit of those players isn't their consistency. It's, it's the fact that any one of them have the tools and skills necessary to win an event. And while Gannon was certainly the in the spotlight as kind of the unexpected star of 2022, Prodigy could have a very successful season by either having one of their stars play incredibly well. Isaac wins a multi multiple pro uh, elite series events. Gannon wins multiple elite series events at a major. Kevin Jones comes back, wins multiple elite series events or a major. Any one of those storylines by themselves are a successful season for the Prodigy MPO team. But if each of those guys each won one event and was in contention for another one, that still would be seen when we look holistically at the season. We're going to be talking about the Prodigy guys a lot. 
And that would also be a really, really big win for Prodigy. So I think they're poised for just some overwhelming success thanks to the multiple ways in which their team could truly succeed for them as a manufacturer. Now, I think it's going to be really expensive to make that, to replicate that after this year. <laughs> and I don't see it as terribly likely. But I think that this season in particular, Prodigy is poised to have, uh, th- th- I just don't see a lot of downside to Prodigy in the Manufacturers Cup this year. What's next, Josh? Um, next one. I I think this is so cool. Uh, Innova versus Discraft FPO teams. I think those two teams have. And it's interesting because you know taking out DGA Katrina Allen and then Kristen Tatar, the depth of those two teams is most of the FPO, like, top 10. And honestly, most of the FPO top 20. At most, right. So so if we jump over to the uh, the composite rankings on, on Ulti World, Kristen is number one, Latitude 64. Katrina Allen is number two, DGA. And then you have Paige, Discraft, Own, Innova, Missy, Discraft, Valerie, Discraft, Henna, Innova, Evelina, Innova, Natalie Ryan, Neptune, Haley King, Innova, Sarah Hokum, MVP, and then you've got Holland Hanley at Discraft, and then it, and then Ella Hansen is Dynamic Discs, Macy Vela Diaz is DD, and then you, Kat you, Birch, you, you mean Ella Hansen is Discmania? You just Discmania, di- thank you, Discmania, and then uh, Cat Merch, Jennifer Allen, Emily Beach, all Innova. Alexis Montehano Discraft, Jessica <laughs> Weiss, Innova. Like, that's the top 20. There are, in the top 20, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now with Lisa Fakus leaving. So 12 of the top 20 are own, are, are in the Discraft or Innova camps. And it's a pretty even split. It's I think it's seven and five. So I am really excited to watch the progress of of this dynamic going into next year to see who's going to have the stronger FPO team. It's it's 13 out of the 20, by the way. Is uh, it 13? Eight in of a five discraft. Oh, okay. Um, yes. So, it, yeah, look, it, it's... Uh, I, I'm... I don't care, really. You know, like... <laughs> who has the better year from the manufacturer's side of things. But I do think it's very interesting to keep an eye on this kind of arms race that we've seen. Because I think one of the things that's been sort of like unspoken about this whole thing, FPO investment from companies was nil until about three years ago. I mean, we had multiple high-profile departures of FPO players from longtime sponsors because they felt they were being disrespected and not earning what they deserved. Remember when Val Jenkins left Innova? Yep. Like, that was like, whoa. And then Elaine King leaves Discraft. Whoa. Like, there were... This has been an issue, and I don't think companies have properly identified until recently the value there. Not only is FPO popul- increasingly popular with fans of disc golf, which, by the way, are predominantly men, um, but think about the potential growth that the sport can have with women long term. Mm-hmm. That is just so massive. And I think that's why you're seeing Innova go out there and bid up for Hannah and, Eve- and Evelina against yep. competitors who are trying to pick them off in Europe. That's why you're seeing Discraft massively expand its team paying page you know Kristen's getting paid Kona's getting paid you're seeing players making six figures including you know for page upper six figures for a year of you know sponsor being sponsored by a manufacturer and so th- that's like this sort of undercurrent of this and obviously other manufacturers are trying to get into the door and and MPO players are still commanding much bigger salaries overall, but there are opportunities there if the marketing is done correctly. Paige has proven that. Kristen has proven that. And, you know, as is usually the case, the 
the the value is accruing mostly to the very top players, but the same thing is true in MPO. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. No question. Um, I'm going to run one back from last year. Can somebody from Europe on the MPO side get a win? Yes. I mean, I, this was one yeah. <laughs> from last year, but I, I feel like it's still true now. And it, we're going to see more touring players from Europe coming into the U.S., playing regularly. And we have an expanded European side of the tour. Paul McBeth going over for a few weeks mm-hmm. to play a lot of different of the Euro Tour events. I think this is going to be, a, you know, another kind of expansion of European competition. And I want to see, can Nicholas Antela get one? Can Linus Carlson get one? Can Can somebody other than Simon get one? <laughs> Right. Uh, you know, I think I, I know we did this last year and we'll have to go back and see which, who took on which side. But uh, Charlie, over under oh, no. half, half a win, <laughs> European men not named Simon on a DGPT elite series event. Elite or major, obviously. Elite or major. Yeah. Elite no or silver. major, no silver. Because we already had silver. Albert did, Tom yeah, won Albert one. Tom won one last yes. year. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to take the under. I still think the odds are on the under. Okay. But Nick, I mean, Nicholas really showed us last year at USDGC that he's he's got what it takes. Nicholas I just, was like one hole away. Yeah, I just I just can't I can't I can't do it. I can't do it. I haven't seen enough. Okay. Give me the That'll under. Be interesting. Okay. It will. Well, I, I have another one that's maybe not quite so much a big big picture storyline but as i you know we were prepping the segment i went to the composite rankings and i realized that we've got three guys inside the top 12 who don't have an elite series or major win okay okay and and once you get down to like 15 and below you've got a you got a couple and a handful of them who are in that boat but in the top 12 there are three Mattio, Joel Freeman Mm-hmm. And Corey Ellis. Has Joel Freeman won a national tour event, though? Maybe no. not. No. Okay. So I don't he won think the silver. The... That's his first tour I think, win. I think they, a couple of them have silvers, but I don't think any of those three. Did Matteo win the preserve, though? No, he's never won one. He's never won one. Okay. I'm second guessing myself now because um, they're just excellent players who you would think of. I, I mean, Matteo has been a beast for a long time, and, but that's the whole thing. He's been the bridesmaid, never the bride. That's right. So. You know, with with that group, those three, who do you think is most likely to get a win this season? Elite Series win. Joel Freeman. Joel Freeman. I don't Freeman. even have a question in my mind. Really? Interesting. Yep. He he has shown that he's got the skill to win an Elite mm-hmm. Series. And I think, you know, Corey came close at MVP. Yep. But wasn't mentally ready, you know? Like... I, and I think he, all three guys have the skill to do it. I mean, there's a reason they they're do. in the top 12. Yeah. They, they finish high a lot. Uh, but I think that Joel Freeman leveled up last year. And I think you saw it at Butler County where it's like, if the dude is on, he is as good as anybody. Yep. He is. And I think we saw more high level consistency from Joel Freeman and more like top level takeover skill. Um, and I don't see why he can't take another step forward this year and get a get an elite series win. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take Matty O. Uh, he he has come close as well. Uh, oh yeah, handful of second. I mean, second place at GMC is one that comes to mind. Uh, he was tied for third at Worlds this year. Like he has shown the kind of resilience at big tournaments with strong fields that I think is going to be necessary for him to take down a win. And so I I, I think it's going to be Matteo. That's that's my pick. Listeners win if Corey Ellis gets it first. Listen. <laughs> we give the audience Corey Ellis, which I, I like wouldn't be that. sad to have any of these guys as my I, horse that I'm rooting for this year. I wouldn't either. Um, yeah. Fascinating stuff. All right. We are going to talk about our off-the-course big picture storylines in our subscriber only bonus segment so get yourself a subscription get ready for the season we're going to start rocking and rolling with our live react shows uh go to discgolf.oldhero.com slash subscribe it's less than four dollars a month and we will break those down over there Uh, i would also like to note we're going to do some mailbag on thursday we've already got some great mail in from last week's shows so get your thoughts in upshot 
And uh, also hit us up in the Discord if you're a subscriber. And we will look forward to hearing from you so that we can talk about your thoughts on the air. So that's going to do it for today's episode. For Josh Mansfield, I'm Charlie Eisenhood saying so long. And we'll talk to you on Thursday right here on The Upshot. The Upshot.